All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is a session on geoscience ontologies. Um, we've got speakers who will be um, providing overviews of some recent activities of the geocore ontology from uh, Mara Abel and Lu Luan Fonseca at the uh, Federal University in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. And Alicia Montovani will be talking about ontogenous developed in, in Italy. Um, and uh, Boyan Broderick and I will talk about the geoscience ontology, and then we'll get a brief um, review or overview on SWEET, which is a sort of large uh, global kind of coverage ontology that's uh, under the stewardship of ESIP these days. Brandon Whitehill will be speaking, and Pierluigi Buttigieg will give us a, a brief um, overview on ENVO. And then we have some discussion about um, what the use cases are for these different kinds of ontologies and whether they fulfill all the needs of the community. Are there things we could do to, to be integrating these um, or are there really different enough use cases? So as we get started, um, if you're in the Kiko chat page, which you should see on the screen right now, um, we have an agenda document. Please uh, sign in on the attendance and check in there. You can see people are contributing to that now. So please uh, visit that page and add your name. And uh, we have our agenda here. We got some logistics. I have set up a Jamboard um, for this session for people to post comments and questions during the presentations as we go along. And we'll return to the Jamboard during the discussion period just to look and see what we've got there um, in terms of contributing. So there's a link here for the Jamboard on the agenda page. I think it's under the schedule here. And what that looks like is this. There's three tabs in there that have some questions on it. Um, and please feel free to add to that as we go along. Let's see, other items here. Introduce the speakers. And uh, if you would like to add notes, please do do that. We can just put them in the agenda here um, in, we'll, along with each talk as we go along. So that'd be the best way to do that, to keep the notes together here. And I think that's uh, that's good. So we have the standard ESIP community participation guidelines. And so the goals here are again, to provide an overview of these different ontology activities that are going on and to, to start thinking about how these relate to SWEET and ENVO and the ESIP environment and the activities that are going on integrating SWEET and ENVO and um, what the role of more specific geoscience domain ontologies would be in this larger landscape. And so without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to you, Luan, to uh, present about the GeoCore ontology. So you can share your screen and Luan will speak. I will uh, share now. Uh, can you see it? Not yet. Mm. I'll try again. There we go. Okay. Can you see it full screen now? All okay. good. Okay, so I will start. My name is uh, Luan Fonseca Garcia. I work at the Informatics Institute at the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. And I'm, I, I'm going to present here the, the GeoCore ontology. Uh, a core ontology for geological knowledge description. This is a, a work in collaboration with Professor uh, Marabel and Professor Michel Perrin. So geocore ontology is a, a core ontology for, for geology. So it, it has a strong philosophical background during the, the, its development. It's based on the, the basic form of ontology. So we use the basic form ontology as a top level ontology. And the, the, its idea is the, its main goal is to facilitate ontology development and ontology integration in the, the domain of uh, geoscience. And uh, when 
developing a gel core, we had uh, two uh, very important aspects that we we took in consideration. The, the first one is regarding our philosophical assumptions. So we had adopted here a philosophical realistic view where the entities we consider here and the properties that uh, characterize them, they exist independently of anyone's belief, linguistic practice, conceptual views, descriptions, interpretation, or anything like that. And the second one is a constitution view, which is a metaphysical view that uh, accepts the possibility of existing two different uh, material objects at the same place at the same time, if they are holding a, a relation of constitution constitution and this will be more clear in the next slides and the second aspect uh, that we wanted to consider is that we wanted to represent the material entities from the different geological scales and their uh, specific relationship so we wanted to represent entities ranging from the the, the scale of uh, scanning and lateral microscopes so micrometers to the scale of uh, uh, basins and continents, uh, continents, uh, so having a thousand of uh, kilometers of size. And uh, we can see here uh, uh, also that we wanted to deal with the plura plura plurality of entities and, and the scale. And that's why, for instance, in this outcrop picture here, we have a lithological unit. We have the amount of rock that constitutes that unit. We have the, the grains that are part of the, the, the unit and constitute the rock. So we have at least uh, four different uh, entities, including the, the outcrop, material entities, and uh, each one in a different uh, scale. And the central idea of uh, geocore ontology is this. So Geoscientists have to deal with two uh, kinds of uh, material entities, earth materials and uh, geological objects. So they, they, they are related, but they are distinct entities. Earth materials refer to those, uh, to, to those uh, naturally occurring materials that we can find on earth. So they can be solids or fluids like this petroleum or, or rocks and they have no unifying criteria for their, their parts. So those, they are not necessarily maximally self-connected, especially me, uh, uh, speaking. And uh, on the other hand, we have the geological objects, which are 3D objects, which definite boundaries and uh, a, a clear uh, unifying criteria for its parts. And they are constituted by earth materials. While we, we, we can only see in, in nature, earth materials when they are constituting objects. And uh, this separation of the matter from, from the object for us, it, it is important because it is what allow us to analyze and uh, extrapolate properties of the rock independently from the properties of the, 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 the object that it is constituting. And uh, both earth material and geological objects, they are generated by uh, geological processes. So this is what differentiates an, uh, a geological object from an engineering artifact that is uh, uh, constructed by man hand. So this is the, the, the core idea of GeoCore. And uh, we also deal with uh, geological time here. So both earth material and geological object, they, they have a, a geological age. The, their geological age is related to, to some uh, geological time interval, which is the, the, the time interval in which the process that generated then uh, occurred. And the, these intervals, they are related to the, the, to the, the geological time scale, which is maintained by the International Commission on um, Stratigraphy. Objects may also be the carrier of geological structures. So we have uh, tectonic structures, sedimentary structures, like in, in, the, in this top figure, we have uh, a tectonic structure of fold. And in the bottom picture, we have a cross stratification. So a sedimentary structure. And structures are these patterns that, uh, that are the internal arrangement of the parts of some object. 
uh, when two different uh, objects, they are uh, physically adjacent, so the, the boundaries are in contact, they are said to be in geological contact. And uh, every geological object has a boundary, which is the surface that uh, bounds the exterior of the, the object. So it's the thin surface that uh, bounds the object. And uh, here we, we have a simple example of how we can use uh, GeoCore to, to represent uh, uh, geological knowledge. So we have a, a geological object here which is constituted, which is composed by three different layers, here, here, and here. And each layer is constituted by a specific amount of rock. So we have three different instances of amounts of rock. And uh, the, here we can see that the layer two was generated by a process of uh, sedimentation. And because the layer was uh, generated by uh, this, this process, it resulted in a structure of a stratification. And uh, we have that the sedimentation process occur uh, in a geological time in interval one here. And because layer two is on top of uh, layer three, uh, the boundaries are adjacent. So we have that uh, the layer two and layer three, they are having a geological contact. And uh, at some time after time one, a process of folding occur in object O. And now we have that the object is also the bearer of a fold structure. And later at time three, after time two, a process of fault in the uh, curve, which is split the object, and now the object is also the bearer of uh, a fault structure. So this is a simple example of how uh, GeoCor can be used to, dec to decide which entities of the domain we should analyze and, and focus on, on representing. And, but why do we need a, a core ontology for geology? Well, Ontology development is it's quite expensive. So the process of building an ontology takes a long time and is really resource, resource consuming. So we, we should really reuse ontologies when, when possible. But the problem is that when ontologists, they, they develop their, their ontology with distinct views and uh, distinct ontological choices, the, the result is that we have a hard time and in, in, in need to, to do a, a hard adaptation of the ontology to integrate them. So the idea is that an ontology with a, a higher level of abstraction, such as a core ontology, helps to standardize these views over the domain and restrict uh, the possible ontological choices. And a, a core ontology for the domain can also pose as a serve as a central hub for an ontology network. Uh, in the sense, an ontology network is this uh, is an aggregation of uh, different ontologies that are related somehow, and each ontology is considered as a model. So the idea here is very similar to uh, as uh, to to software modularity. And uh, in this specific architecture, we have a top ontology, which unifies the general view of the world. We have some core ontologies defining high level concepts of the domains. And we have the domain ontology uh, that, is, that define the very specific domain concepts uh, covering the, the uh, therefore covering the whole domain. And what we are working high, right now is an uh, uh, ontology nectar for petroleum exploration and, and production. So GeoCore enables us to, to create this uh, ontology network, uh, acting as a central hub for all the entities related to, to geology. So we have uh, the GeoCore, we have uh, ontolo ontologies for spatial relations, uh, geological time, possible uh, domain ontology such as structural ontology, rock taxonomy, petrology, stratigraphy, and so on. And we also use the information artifact ontology, which is based on BFO, for representing the, the, the information artifacts of geology. So the geological representations, they are uh, an extension of uh, information artifact ontology. We have also another core ontology, which is the industrial ontology foundry 
which is an uh, ontology maintained for the industrial engineering uh, domain, where we, we have many domain uh, ontologies for, uh, for, for covering engineering concepts. Uh, an example of uh, how such a network can be used is the system that we develop in cooperation with Petrobras. So it's a, a system to annotate uh, geological figures based on the, the ontology. So it uses the terminology and the hierarchy of the, the ontology to, to annotate different figures of the geological domain. And the idea is that the experts annotate the figures that are later used for training a neural network for the classification task of, uh, of uh, visual geological representations. And uh, in the end, we, we developed this network, neural network, using a higher, higher, higher hierarchical structure where we have different uh, networks for classifying specific group, groups of figures. For instance, here I have an example of an ontology for classification of maps, another one for classification of graph, graphs and we have also for cross sections and, and so on. And the network could uh, have a, the network that we trained had a, a precision as high as 92% uh, of, uh, of uh, right uh, uh, classifications. And uh, the, the, we trained it uh, using over 23,000 annotated images that con could only be annotated because they had an, uh, that system based on an uh, ontology. Today, what we have are uh, an ontology for visual information artifacts uh, used in the exploration and production, a deep sea environment uh, ontology, basically for turbidites representation, an ontology for representing spatial relations of geological objects, and the ontology for petroleum production plant. And we are de developing also other ontologies, which can be found uh, in your ontology repository, which is a, a GitHub of the, the, our lab that you can find in this address, github.com slash BDI uh, UFRGS. Uh, I'd like to thank here the CAPES, CNPQ, Petrobras for uh, making this, this uh, work possible. And also Steve and brother, brother Rick for inviting me for speaking here. Thank you. Thanks, Luan. Um, interesting. I guess we actually have a, a minute or so if there, anyone has a quick question they'd like to pose. Um, Otherwise, we'll move along. Um, uh, All right. So next will be Alicia Mantovani speaking about the geoontogenous ontology developed uh, by her team in Italy. And if you could share your screen, over to you, Alicia. OK, I share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, can you see my presentation? Yeah, full screen. Okay, Got perfect. It. So, uh, hello everyone, I'm Alizia Mantovani. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the University of Turin. And uh, with my team uh, uh, composed by me, Vincenzo Lombardo and Fabrizio Piana, we created this uh, onto ontology named Ontogenus and its application for the geological map uh, Ontogeobase. Uh, today, I uh, present you um, our, our ontology and uh, uh, its application to the geological mapping um, through the design of this uh, ontology-driven database named OntogeoBase. Uh, during my presentation, I'll uh, also show you an operative demo recently produced uh, for our database. Um, our project uh, starts from the well-rooted practice of producing geological maps uh, through digital technologies. But despite uh, the, um, the easy sharing of the data, uh, the interoperability uh, of, of data is still a difficult task. Uh, so a common knowledge base uh, should be used to support uh, the representation of the knowledge. 
Uh, in this context, we created Ontogeonus, uh, an ontology for the geosciences, uh, with the goal to support the representation of data uh, through uh, ontology-driven database and uh, other services uh, for interoperability. Um, Ontogenus is a domain ontology uh, that is a model for a specific part of the knowledge, and our domain uh, is, of course, uh, uh, geology, and uh, uh, especially uh, the, the, the knowledge for the geological mapping task. Uh, so uh, our ontology can support uh, two main tasks. Uh, one uh, is the one for the geological mapping, and uh, uh, the other one um, is the uh, there are the coherent representation of data across different projects. And uh, I'll present to you um, two examples of uh, ontology driven data entry forms uh, to collect data for mapping uh, and for uh, collecting data for ornamental stones uh, based on the same concept in order to exploit uh, the already encoded knowledge. Um, the concept present in, the, in Ontogenus uh, comes from the international standards for geology that are just uh, CGI, Geoscience ML, Inspire, and also Sweet Ontology. This is a very um, important uh, uh, part of, of, of our ontology. The, our ontology comes from these standards. It's the encoding of these standards. Uh, the main class, uh, for example, of the ontology is the geologic feature that collects uh, all the items that are represented in a geological map or that have a relation with some geologic history. Uh, there is a concept from Justin SML where uh, it has four main subclasses, uh, which are geologic unit, geologic structure, geologic event, and geomorphologic features. Uh, their encoding uh, is based on the, on the definition uh, that uh, are provided by the standards. Uh, summarizing, uh, we started from the international standards to create a, a domain ontology for the geosciences, and we provided some tools for different tasks. One of these uh, is the ontology driven database for the standard compliance storing, uh, storing uh, of the geological map data. Um, Ontogenus is useful for three main points the representation of general and specific, and specific geologic uh, knowledge, the production of uh, uh, semantic informed geological maps and uh, for supporting web services for the users. Uh, the core of this talk uh, will be to show the application of Ontogenus uh, to the geological mapping task, but I'll start from the, the concept uh, um, for the encoding of Ontogenus itself, and I will conclude with the representation of some of the web services. Um, the traditional uh, map legend of the non-formal concept map are the first step uh, of the conceptual model of the ontology, uh, and that provides the concept, the concept to encode. Um, the concepts are organized into taxonomies, uh, comparing the UML schemata for, uh, by Geoscience ML to the non-formal conceptual model of the map. Uh, once achieved uh, that a taxonomy of classes, the further step, the further step uh, is to encode the knowledge into a machine-readable language. Uh, the first step of this uh, part is to uh, find adequate uh, definition for, from the authoritative sources. Uh, for example, here we use the uh, Justense ML uh, and Inspire. Justense ML, both the definition, the verbal definition and the uh, UML schemata. Um, sometimes we also use the CCI vocabularies and, um, and sweet ontology. Um, then in the orange table, uh, we see how the definition in natural language are fragmented into simplest concept. Each one of these will be translated in the machine readable language. Um, for example, the part uh, along which displacement, displacement has occurred uh, will become uh, the property as movement with the value true. Uh, so every one of these fragments will be translated into uh, the machine readable language. Then all these fragments uh, will be um, organized by end or operator, and we will finally have the axiom, which is this one for is an example for the shear displacement structure. Um, here, uh, all the properties are related by the end operator because the, the, the represent condition that must satisfy it, uh, satisfied at the same time. Uh, and below, we can see the graphic representation where the properties uh, uh, represented by the arrows connect the class, the main class shear displacement structure, to the other classes or uh, values or, or items. Uh, the final product uh, is a taxonomy composed by a chain of subclasses. Uh, and in Ontogenus, we can say that the, mm, the taxonomy is uh, very much inspired uh, by the one proposed by Geoscience ML. So 
the second task. Uh, once encoded, uh, an ontology can be applied to uh, many issues in geology. Uh, now we will focus on what concerns the geological mapping task, uh, which is uh, uh, drawing maps and designing a related, a related geo uh, ontology driven geodatabase. Uh, our case study leans uh, on the geological map of Piemonte. Uh, here we propose a method to exploit the encoded knowledge for the design of the database. Uh, the goal uh, is to describe the items uh, as the standard require. Uh, to make this possible, each property of the ontology axiom becomes a column of the database. Uh, our database, named ontology base, is the structure as presented here uh, in the right. Uh, first, it has a number of tables. Uh, each containing all the features uh, of a relevant class. Here we see a table for the lithostatic graphic unit, uh, one for the geologic structure, uh, all containing um, physical elements uh, that are represented in the map. And here we have a, a table for the geologic event, uh, which clearly cannot contain physical representable feature, but is very important for a, a complete uh, description uh, of the items um, collected here in the other tables. Uh, now we'll see uh, as an example of the design of the database, uh, the table for the geologic structure. Uh, here we can see uh, two examples, uh, one for uh, the shear displacement structure, Lacanova fault, and one for the contacts, S1. Um, the, in fact, the geologic structure table contains all the geologic structure uh, present in the map. Uh, in this case, a shear displacement structure and a contact. Um, all the tables are organized as presented here. Um, they have three main sections um, that are the taxonomy columns uh, that represent the classes in which uh, step by step uh, an item can be classified from the larger to the smaller. Uh, in the example of the Canova fault, uh, it is uh, the chain of uh, classes from geologic structures to a reverse fault that is here uh, uh, yellow highlighted. Um, then we have the definitory columns um, that collect all the properties of the ontology. In this example, uh, it contains all the properties uh, that are necessary to describe all the sheet displacement structure, all the contexts, and all of their subclasses. Um, in this picture, we can see um, the orange highlighted values that are uh, those for the sheet displacement structure and the green for the contacts. So here, every property of the ontology becomes a column of the database. Finally, we have the other column sections uh, that collect uh, every other useful information, which, however, uh, is not necessary for the classification uh, of the item. Uh, this method uh, makes possible to make explicit uh, all these uh, relations present in the geological map that are implicit and are only represented um, by graphic uh, um, by graphic conventions. So uh, we can. Uh, um, we can represent uh, in the table uh, everything that is represented uh, by uh, graphic symbols in the map. Um, so in the next slide, I show you uh, an operative filling form for ontogeo base. Um, in the previous slides, uh, every property uh, became a column of the database. Here we created uh, a filling form to, to fill the database um, in order to make it uh, a little more human friendly. Uh, so every property uh, becomes a field to fill. Uh, in the red square, uh, there are the information that uh, all the information that is necessary to describe a little stratigraphic unit. Here there is a collecting form for a little stratigraphic unit. Um, and every one of this field um, is uh, an ontogenous property. However, it is expressed um, with a label uh, in a human language. For example, the first one, what is the main lithology of the unit, uh, correspond to the property of ontogenous as lithology. Um, as you can see, uh, almost every field uh, has a drop down menu. Uh, among which uh, it is possible to choose uh, between um, uh, classes of the ontology or vocabularies or items. Uh, for example, the field uh, has lithology, mm, showed before, has the vocabulary simple lithology from CGI. Um, a very important point of this method uh, um, is that uh, um, many different group of data uh, can be represented over the same knowledge base. Uh, for example, after building uh, this collecting form uh, following uh, the ontogeo uh, ontogeo-based structure, 
um, we create another filling form for the ornamental stones, uh, also based on the ontogenous properties. Um, here, in fact, are used uh, um, the same properties and the same vocabularies that uh, were used in the previous uh, filling form for the units. Um, for example, here, uh, with the, the label petrographic name, uh, this, this, this label uh, correspond uh, again to the has lithology property, the same that uh, was uh, uh, present in the other collecting form. And again, it has the simple lithology vocabulary um, to, for, the, the, um, for the selection of the lithology. Uh, moreover, uh, some items that are already present uh, in the database can be used to describe uh, new items. For example, here in the ornamental stone collecting form, um, there is the field tectonic unit uh, that would be the has geologic unit property in ontogenus. Um, and uh, clicking on, on this, uh, on, on the, the field, please choose one, uh, we can see uh, a list of geologic units collected in the previous uh, collecting form, among which one, one can choose um, and select uh, what uh, geologic unit provides the ornamental stone that uh, we are describing. Uh, this concept is very important and take us back to one of the first slides here on this schema. Uh, and uh, it's important to point out that ontogenus can support different tasks uh, and different projects can lean on the same knowledge base and thus their data can be inter interoperable. Uh, to make the knowledge exploitable by users, uh, we developed some web services uh, are summarized in this slide. So um, this is, uh, we, we have uh, um, uh, the interactive geological map of Piemonte, uh, a wiki website uh, for uh, ontogenus and collecting forms open to public. Um, this is the Geological Map of Piemonte interface. It is provided with the ontology-driven database, uh, which appear clicking on any of the items of the map. We can see here all uh, uh, the, the row of the database clicking on the, this uh, uh, geologic unit, unit. We can see all the information here in the row and here in this, uh, um, in this uh, window. Um, here it is uh, one of the wiki pages uh, in which uh, all the encoding process, the source of the knowledge, uh, the application of ontology and median information, so all the theory of ontogenus. Here it's everything, everything is, uh, is reported so it is possible to, to know more about uh, ontogenus. And finally, there are, there are some new websites uh, with the collecting forms that I showed you earlier um, that are open to public so, public. so anyone can go on that website and fill in with, uh, its data, uh, with his data and that will be um, recorded in the database. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, today I presented Ontogeus, uh, that is an ontology for the geosciences, uh, based on the standard for, uh, for geology uh, oriented to the geological mapping task. Uh, over Ontogeus, we created an ontology-driven geodatabase uh, and related filling forms uh, to represent the geological knowledge uh, following the international standards. And over the same knowledge base, we created also uh, different services to collect data for different projects uh, with the same criteria uh, to explore common vocabularies, items, uh, property relationships, and uh, more general common knowledge. So thank you for uh, letting me talk and for listening. Thank you, Alicia. Um... We have a, a minute or two for questions. I actually had a question. I was wondering, are you using um, any kind of RDF or triple store representation of the ontology that you're you know, accessing using Sparkle kinds of data um, queries or analysis? No, actually the, um, uh, the ontology is on uh, all uh, files. So for now RDF, no, so on all uh, we use Protégé. Mm -hmm. if, if, it were, if it was this the, the question. I was just wondering if, if it sounds like all, most of the querying and access to the data is done through a relational database. Yes, yes. Relational mm -hmm. implementation. Yeah, it's a relational okay. database. Good. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes, may I, I should I write or can I speak? Uh, why don't you go ahead? I, I think we have a, I, we have a 
couple minutes. Okay. No, I I was wondering if uh, the way you translate the 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 the, the ontology to the the relational database, the use any kind of uh, frameworks such as on top or maestro or how, how do you translate the ontology to the database? Uh, well, we, we did it uh, kind, kind like manually. Uh, I mean, uh, we created our, data, our first prototype of database uh, with um, um, quantum GIS. Uh, so we, um, we started from the properties and we created the, um, uh, the column of the database, uh, but uh, um, recently we created the, the filling forms that, that I presented to you. Uh, and here, uh, the relations uh, uh, between the, 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 the database, the, 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 the tables of the database, um, are created automatically with the platform Omeka S. We created our um, entry forms with this platform, uh, and um, there the relations are. Uh, um, uh, are automatically created there with uh, when when you create an item uh, or, or with a resource template with a, a filling form, uh, it puts it in a class uh, and then you can um, take it for uh, all the, for other tables. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right, um, we'll move along now. Um, the next speaker will be well, Boyan Broderick will be presenting, and uh, I'll be sharing. I'm with him. Just wanted uh, for those of you who might have joined a little bit later to point out that we have this uh, jam board accessible for posting questions and comments um, during the presentations um, if you'd like. And that's there's a link in the uh, Kiko chat landing page for that in the uh, welcome here for this jam board. So just reminding people that that's there and, and uh, use it if you can. And uh, I'll start the presentation here now. Boyan will speak first and then we'll we'll uh, split, change over. So over to you, Boyan. Uh, you're muted. Of course I'm muted. <laughs> uh, thanks, Steve. Um, let me start by uh, first thanking Steve for organizing the bulk of this uh, and uh, for the speakers also for accepting and speaking and uh, to the audience for attending. Um, but uh, primarily thanks Steve for doing the bulk of the work here. As Steve mentioned, he and I will be splitting this uh, talk uh, down the middle roughly. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start. And speaking about the geoscience ontology, uh, which or GSO, which we've been developing over the last uh, three years or so. Uh, the purpose of the ontology is to be able to represent any form of uh, geological knowledge. Um, but a, a secondary purpose is also more of a research purpose, and that is to investigate uh, you know, deeper ontological and to some degree, uh, you know, different ontological analysis of geological entities. So it's, uh, it sort of has two aspects. One is a practical aspect and another is more exploratory aspect. Uh, next slide, Steve. Oh, next slide, Steve. There we go. Uh, the activity itself is housed within a research project called the Loop 3D project, which intends to develop uh, new algorithms for 3D modeling in the geosciences. Part of that project is uh, an endeavor to increase the amount of knowledge content used by 3D modeling tools, which requires a geological knowledge manager. So the part of the project that we're intimately involved in is developing a generic geoscience knowledge manager. Um, as part of that, uh, for structuring the knowledge, uh, we determined the geoscience ontology was required. So GSO actually comes, uh, is housed in this research activity. Uh, it has participants from North America, Australia, and Europe. Next slide, Steve. Although probably needless to say to this crowd, uh, the, the notion of adding more knowledge to a geoscience computing environment uh, requires two things, uh, particularly if we want to make it uh, expandable enough to uh, deal with the wide variety of things across the domain. Uh, one is a series of uh, framework concepts uh, at various levels of depth and detail. The second is a, a language to encode both those concepts and instance of those concepts which can describe real world uh, earth science situations. 
Uh, so the, uh, the GSO encompasses both of those, and you can see examples of that on the screen here with the encoding uh, on the right in a turtle format of uh, OWL RDF. Next slide, Steve. So uh, some of the uh, principles driving GSO is that it had to be both broad and deep. That is, we wanted to be able to encode uh, typical scenarios across the wide diversity of geoscience. So we want a good framework, both uh, an upper level framework as well as a geological framework was necessary. And then a certain amount of depth was necessary uh, to extend those frameworks into particular geoscientific areas. And that needed to be modular to allow plug and play uh, in, in multiple ways. Uh, first of all, simply being able to extend a core framework, but secondly, for having different interpretations potentially and different applications for different systems. So we might have the same idea interpreted differently in different modules, or for instance, have more detail in some specific uh, uh, pieces of knowledge for particular computing environments, in, uh, my system versus your system, for example. Um, so that led to uh, a GitHub environment analysis uh, using uh, top level ontological foundational concepts, first order logic, some of it expressed in UML, and then encoded uh, in uh, OWL with uh, various tools, including top rate and protege, and then applied to examples. And we're currently in the uh, the testing and implementation phase for uh, incorporating this knowledge into a broader knowledge framework uh, and platform. Okay, Steve, next slide. Uh, I, I should add uh, before we, we move on that the work is also, uh, you know, an extension of both standards efforts under GeoSciML particularly influenced, but, but also uh, work that's been going on in some upper level ontologies. And the idea was to be able to merge some new ideas uh, within upper level ontologies to uh, our needs for geoscience. Uh, and that, uh, that work actually started over 10 years ago and then was paused for quite a while. So the genesis of GSO actually exists in the early 2000s, uh, but uh, was on pause for maybe a good decade and then picked up again a few years ago. And it's led to this modular organization very similar to uh, what uh, uh, Luan talked about uh, in a three layer structure with uh, a foundational layer of things that apply to any domain, uh, core concepts for geology, and then more, more detailed areas of geology that uh, ideally are modularized and can be uh, swapped in and out as required. Uh, and in fact, the overall organization and many of the concepts are very similar to GeoCore, but there's also some significant differences in interpretation of some of the uh, uh, basic ideas. Uh, but, but the overall fit is, is quite similar. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, Steve. So uh, to give you a sense of the size of things, uh, in these three layers, we have the foundational layer, which is core concepts and uh, is about a a hundred classes and a thousand axioms used to represent it, whereas the geological layer adds about 40 more classes and, you know, a few hundred more axioms to represent that. Uh, but then the core modules, and you can see there are over 30 modules to deal with things like, uh, you know, different geological properties, uh, minerals, uh, materials, uh, rock types, uh, settings, uh, types of structures, and so on. Um, and the, the count for cl the classes here goes up to almost 7,000, where several thousand of those are just different mineral species, for example. So the over 30 modules have, uh, you know, roughly 7,000 different uh, types within them and over 120,000 different uh, uh, axioms. That's okay, Steve. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the thinking then in, for the core objects, uh, one of the things uh, or core types, one of the things that uh, we distinguish, for example, is similar to uh, a little to what Luan was describing, is uh, 
you know, geological objects from materials, and then within geological objects, particularly uh, looking at uh, some core distinctions between uh, objects like boulders and crystals that are specific and can be placed in one location or another without, re without losing identity. A particular boulder would still be a boulder, would still be the same boulder if it was on Mars. Whereas a geological unit uh, isn't necessarily like that. Um, a formation, for example, if it was taken out of its stratigraphic column and put into a different column, might actually be called most likely a different formation because it's contextually oriented. So, um, you know, we differentiate uh, in terms of some of the ontological analysis between things that are contextual and unfragmented and things that are fragmented and contextual. Similar lines of thinking, next slide, apply to geological structures, which are seen as dependent entities uh, that are uh, dependent on multiple things, including uh, hosts on the one hand and things that form their parts on the other hand. So the relation between the hosts and the parts is what causes uh, a geological structure to emerge. So geological structures are these nebulous things that are derived from relations between rock bodies and, and possibly other things, such as a contact being a, a surface related to two host rock bodies, uh, and a fault being a displacement perhaps you know, along that surface. Um, so, uh, and then this has been taken into account to develop uh, essentially a, a whole theory of uh, how different geological structures interact uh, within the ontology. Next slide, Steve. And I believe I'll hand over to you. All righty. Um, so dealing with geologic time is, is an interesting problem. And again, um, in the analysis we've done, we've come to the conclusion that geologic time entities are also features in the sense that Boyan was talking about in that they're dependent in that a, a, ge a geologic date is not just a numerical coordinate in a timeline, but is, is dependent on something in the Brock record in the earth. So there's uh, a geologic time boundary is a contact between units. And then we, we try to, to estimate what the temporal coordinate of that would be. And so we have these geologic time boundaries and time intervals that are um, in the generic sense. This is um, where we have the time scale is really basically in the generic sense just defines a topology where we have these different named eras and the topology defines the sequence of those and the parts. But in order to really anchor those to specific temporal positions, they have to be tied to the rock record. And that ba the binding between the concept of this top to time topology and the rock record has evolved over time from the initial definitions of these ages back in, in the 1800s through the more recent, you know, since about 1970, when we, things started to be defined based on um, GSSPs and have become a lot more firmly anchored in, the, in specific places in the rock body and much more stable. So this time scale has evolved over time and, and the structure we've developed for representing the time scale is designed to account for this evolution of thinking about temp, the binding between the, the, the time, the topologic units and the rock record as temporal features. Um, so, so there's a set of relationships that are based on the Allen relations, if you're familiar with these the, uh, temporal relations, but also dealing with relations not just between intervals, but between intervals and instance and instance um, to express all the, the possible temporal relations between the geologic things we're interested in. So then in, in the examples we've developed, um, Check the time here. Um, we've have what we've done is is started with some cross sections for some basic geologic relations. So in this example here, there's a lot of relationships here, but we're, what we're looking at is this green unit in the middle. It's a the JS Jurassic formation, um, and it has two parts: an upper part and a lower part. And and you can see then in in the encoding using the ontology, it's classified as a formation. The material object, the formation, occupies time directly. So the age of the formation is based on its participation in the event of its deposition. So that's what this, why we say it occupies time indirectly. So a rock body doesn't have an age. What has a, a temporal location are the events that have affected that rock body. 
So in the case of sedimentary units, the event we're usually interested in is its deposition, but there might be other things like the age of, it's when the diagenesis occurred, um, when it was buried, when it was uplifted, if it was metamorphosed. So when we talk about the age of a unit, we might be interested in any of those events in its history. And that's why this, the, it, these geologic units occupy time indirectly. So it has part relationships with the upper and lower parts, which are also rock bodies and can have their own descriptions. But also the contacts of the unit, the base and the top, the boundaries of the unit are also part of the rock body. And in this, this case here, you can see the, the, uh, the top of the unit is boundary number two, but that boundary number two, which is the boundary of the bottom of the late Miocene unit has different parts where what's underneath it is different. So it's a different boundary if the units that are juxtaposed are different. So that, so that that can be represented with as the, the boundary having parts itself. And then we have a way of assigning qualities and the qualities are done basically to a quality property where we have different vocabularies of properties that can be used. And those and values can be assigned depending on the kind of property and whether there are numeric values or categorical values. So the time scale is represented in a, in a pattern that's based on Al time and, and the work that, that I've done with Simon Cox on the time scale, um, where we have the temporal relations and the time topology, and then the association between a specific geologic time unit in a specific time scale that is um, bounded by, it starts um, with the base of the unit, and that base of the unit has a part which is the stratigraphic binding of that unit with a stratigraphic point, this base of the, of the Jurassic stratigraphic point. And then there are estimations of the temporal coordinate for that stratigraphic point, which are shown in the time scale with these numeric ages. And these things can change over time. But if the definition of what the stratigraphic point, the GSSP, the physical location in the rock record, that's the boundary of that unit, doesn't change, it's still the same specific time unit. It's just that our understanding of its, the temporal coordinates of its boundaries can change. Um, we can also represent more complicated structures here, where let's say we have a tilted early Miocene sedimentary unit. Um, so there's a sedimentation event when it was deposited. And it has various processes that are the constituents of that event. So events have processes that are constituents of that event. So debris flow deposition, mass wasting deposition. Um, the unit occupies, the event occupies time directly. Um, and that event then is described um, somewhere else and might have time coordinates. It has, it starts and finishes with some other events. So there's relationships between events that we can represent. And then those events can be associated with temporal coordinates, which are not actually encoded in this example here. So it provides a, a fairly rich way to represent it. We've tested this with, well, with complex structures, also with representing stratigraphic columns. And uh, we've worked with the Isle of Wight and stratigraphic columns in, in uh, British Columbia. So, so that's a brief flash on some of what, what we've been doing with this. Um, there's some links here in the last one, but we're, the next steps here, are we're working on uh, testing this and, and integrating with the, the uh, 3D modeling code that's they're working on in, in the Loop 3D project um, to encode the information from the maps and, and use that as constraints on in, um, implicit 3D model generation. So that's the, uh, that's the story there. Uh, I'm out of time and I'll step up. Let's see. Has Brandon joined us? Are you there, Brandon? Let's see. Yes, I'm here. Oh, am I? Oh, good. Okay. Me? Yeah. And uh, so Brandon was going to give us a brief overview of Sweet. And uh, do you want to do you want to share your screen, Brandon? Yeah. Okay. We're in. All right. Thanks. Over to <laughs> yeah. You. This is this is sort of an overview. Uh, just uh, perhaps an update. I think on on what's been going on with the. ESIP, uh, the Semantic Technologies Committee, and SWEET in general. Um, so hopefully this will be quick and we can move to the discussion portion. Uh, so just a little bit of context and background around SWEET. I'm assuming most of you in the session would have, will know what it is, but uh, uh, to, to further the background a bit, it was developed at NASA JPL um, during the early part of the century that covered versions one, 
to two, essentially. Um, and in 2017, it was released to the public domain um, and then migrated over to, to GitHub, uh, Git repository, which is hosted by ESIP. Uh, and since then, um, I think a large contingent of the people looking after it have been part of the, the ESIP Semantic Technologies Committee. Um, uh, there are others as well, but I, I think they sort of, they, they just generally sort of look after it. Um, and in recent months, we've been talking about, there's been a group talking about the, what, what's the direction. So now that we've, so since 2017, and it had, uh, Sweet had set sort of untouched for a few years, if I recall correctly. Um, so now that we've sort of dusted it off and, and kicked the rust off of it, now what, you know, where are we going to go with Sweet? What does it need? Or how do we want to further development? And so just looking broadly, we we're looking at, well, what does it have and what does it need? Um, so it's, as anybody who's ever looked at it, it's got a broad coverage, right? So currently we've got on the order of 11,000 concepts uh, broken into 225 separate ontologies or ontology files. You can load it all as one massive structure or you can work on modules individually. And I'll share the, this is an image that was used to be on the homepage when it was with NASA and we've just sort of kept it around just to help illustrate um, the ways that it is broken up. So it's sort of matter realm, there's sort of um, <clears throat> logical divisions, if you like. And <clears throat> one of the other, I think, positives around Suite at present is the having dereferenceable URIs. So some of the infrastructure components, um, being able to uh, so hit, if we go to Holocene um, through a browser, <clears throat> we can go and see what is composed or what the, if there were a definition, it would be in there. <clears throat> or if you wanted to look at um, the ontology in, uh, in a pyload, instead of looking at the turtle file. So we've got some, some sort of technical backend set up. Um, and the, excuse me, uh, it's also hosted by ESIP's community ontology repository. Um, so there are links here. I'll post the slides after the session if you are interested. Um, and the ontology repository hosts suite as well as loads of other ontologies that people have uploaded. It also provides a Sparkle endpoint, which means we can interact with it uh, programmatically. Um, there's also a Yazgui interface if you're interested in, in interacting through the browser. It's also openly available. It's community owned and driven. ESIP's hosting it, but they really just are sort of providing the tech and the community sort of drives uh, where it's going. Um, and it's been around for a long time, so it's well known. And you could also make the argument that those are negatives. Uh, but anyway, uh, so areas where we found that it needs improvement. Now, this is just us sort of looking at it, trying to be object objective. It definitely has inconsistent coverage. You'll find areas where there are, it sort of runs, the depth is um, not more consistent, but it, th there's more depth to the structure. There are properties, there are object properties, data type properties, and there are other areas where it's just basically a class and there may be no hierarchy at all. Uh, so yeah, the, the, or the way it's organized is not always intuitive. Um, and working with the whole thing is becoming, um, well, not unmanageable, but it, there, there's quite a bit of grunt to it now. Um, and just in terms of, of the overall number of concepts and how it's structured. Uh, and then the fact that we don't have many, con I don't we have very few concept definitions. So we've recently brought up some of the RDFS comments that were clipped off because they weren't cite, that there was no citation other than having a Wikipedia tag. So we brought those up in an effort to um, look into running some low level NLP uh, diagnostics and scripts to try and use that for matching uh, concepts and their um, RDFS comments with other classes or concepts and their definitions as a way to sort of, uh, as a automated filter. But currently that's an area that's definitely lacking. And also then documentation and of course funding, we, we're, that's a constant thing that we're looking into. Um, so when Steve uh, asked about Sweet and if somebody would represent, um, you know, come and talk about it. I one of the things that you mentioned was uh, was use cases, and that's one area that it's difficult to pin down. And generally speaking, it's the same sort of use cases that you find just generally with like semantic web and ontologies. It's about it's about discovery, data integration, annotation, um, and point being that it seems that a lot 
there's sort of a lot of different perspectives and I'm not sure uh, if there's one direction that is mo um, most apparent or that the community is really driving towards um, seems to be, you know, everybody kind of has their own way they want to use it um, more or less. So, uh, sorry. So one of the ways forward that we've been discussing uh, was a proposal around using suite as a, as a hub for definitions. And this sort of centered around one of the areas that, that has been coming up with the lack of conceptual alignment, right? So in, in, in geoscience domains, and you have terminology or concepts, and lots of people will use them in slightly different ways. And so because there are so many terms um, in suite and pulled out of you know, um, uh, textbooks and so on, we thought <clears throat> the proposal is to add several definitions um, and try and foster that discussion. So you might have a, a definition from, let's say, GCMD or multiple definitions from GCMD, depending on the concept. You might have a def definition from the USGS thesaurus. As you've seen from the talks today, we might have definitions that are um, imported and referenced from uh, GeoCore um, or, or Loop3D or, or whatever. Um, in, a, in hopes that we can sort of figure out uh, the discrepancies in those concept and the concepts um, and where there needs to be more precision or where there's general agreement. So just one as a simple example, uh, it, this could be done several ways. So I'm not suggesting this is exactly how it will be done, but this is just um, illustrating the concept uh, soil. And so we have a class, uh, we have a class definition, a SCOS definition, and we have more than one definition coming from GCMD, um, another definition, uh, I forget where the other one is from, oh, DBpedia, and another one from uh, GAX, the Global Agricultural Concept Space. So you can see because they are, their annotation, it doesn't affect, um, the, it doesn't clash with any of the axioms that might be or might be um, derived or, or implemented, but it does provide some context for the concept that's in the structure. Uh, also, there's a, one of the, one of the, I guess it's an aside for that approach is that we might find that we are able to uplift um, other resources uh, that aren't really web enabled, right? Um, uh, you know, they don't have, they're not using URIs and they're not, they might be on a web page somewhere, but it's not really semantically enabled, if you like. Uh, and one of the other areas that we're working is in, including incorporating definitions, but also mappings, which I didn't put on here. It's also mappings um, to Wikidata, GCMD, USGS, Thesaurus, Gemit, and so on. There are there are others. These are just the ones that we sort of talked about. Um, yeah. One, some of the other questions that have come up are how do we? Um, so we have a way that we like to that we would deprecate classes that we've been using for like when you have a um, because the URIs are um, they're not opaque so then we found some spelling errors for example so we developed a way to deprecate classes that were just they needed to be updated um, but are there other areas or sections that need to be called um, are there areas that are out of date for example um, there was a lot of talk in the last uh, Stephen Boynes talk about geologic time and using what the IUGS has or is publishing. Um, so why, I mean, there's no reason why everybody needs to have their own definition of, of a, you know, a Permian period or anything like that. They, I mean, we can reuse what's, what's been created. I'm trying to figure out where those areas might be um, where we can just import from, from, another, from another structure. Uh, and also, so there's obviously more recent work and then more areas with more precise semantics, which we just heard, just heard talks about uh, a few of those. And then how we interoperate with those. So, you know, is it an import? Is it a mapping? Um, is, it, is it anything? Okay. Um, what, what are, how, how do we want to structure that discussion? And then how do we want to implement and make sure that we can interoperate? Um, and one, one other area of interest, at least for me, is there's, I mean, if you look, through the literature, there's loads of research ontologies, okay, um, that were developed, you know, for a for a degree or for a research program, but they're not necessarily curated or looked after after that. And um, and one of the questions I have is whether Suite might be a place where we can 
pull in some of those structures so that they might be more readily reused. And hopefully then um, leveraging some of the technical infrastructure that Suite has around it currently and, and building off of that. So maybe lending, lending some support in that regard. Um, obviously there's some the, the semantic commitments and so forth that would need to be organized and, and discussed. <clears throat> but that's just an idea. It's just a thought that, that there's been discussion around within the community. <clears throat> and I just wanna say before I finish, um, this is open to anyone who's interested. Uh, the, semantic, the STC is the Semantic Technologies Committee. It's ESIP's Semantic Technologies Committee. And we meet on the last Tuesday of every month. There's more information on our wiki. The events calendar has all the information or ping me. Uh, there's also an email list. Um, after this session, uh, we are going to reinvigorate our suite working sessions. So that means one day a month, we're going to cut out a block of about two hours and have sort of a hackathon and try to address issues and discuss the things that, we, that I went over here and how we're going to implement whatever it is that we, that's been decided. And the last point was um, we have, there's a project in its infancy that we've called the Semantic Resources for Earth and Environment Federation, so the Serene Federation. And really what we're interested in is trying to, do, trying to build up a, basically a catalog of the semantic resources. So everything from uh, taxonomy to sorry up through ontologies that are relevant and available for earth and environmental science. Um, and Steve, if you want, you, you have some experience with that working on, I believe it was Synergy. Uh, so there's, I think there's a, there's a gap there and we've been talking about perhaps there's an, a, a place to fill that and perhaps ESIP could host this. Um, and if you're interested in that at all, again, what, feel free to ping me. Otherwise we meet, uh, it's every second Tuesday of the month uh, and there's more, more information on the ESIP pages. Um, and that's all I have really, hopefully that is useful to everyone. Thanks, Brandon. Um, we have one more uh, brief in presentation. Pierre Luigi Bulici was going to speak about ENVO, which is another large scale ontology with a wide coverage, including various aspects of geoscience. And Pierre, I think you're, you're on the list here. Yeah, so thanks, Steve. Um, so yeah, Steve asked for a relatively informal talk for me. So that's what your this little will be. There are no slides, but I'll share some screens and just talk through it really. Um, feel free to interject at any time if you have questions or would like to know more about anything, just uh, interject as you need to. Um, you should be able to see that browser. Yes. Right? Yeah. Got it. And now you should be now you should see protege, right? Uh protege went away there. That's protege. Great. And now back to so then the browser. Great. So Envo, Envo has an interesting history. It started in the bio, biological domain as part of um, the Genomic Standards Consortium. Back in the day where genomes were coming into the collection and there was no standard way of saying where people sampled that genetic material or that microbial community or what, what have you. And so um, it started as a controlled or a structured vocabulary, not very many definitions or so, but just as a way to get some order to this chaos to enable um, comparative genomics as part of minimal information about sequences that are there. So see, ENVO started back then. Um, Norman Morrison, um, Michael Ashburner, and others were the, the progenitors of ENVO, and I joined a little bit later and then came to run it. Um, and since then, uh, with the help of folks at the Oboe Foundry, it's been elevated away from a simple Oboe style file or structural vocabulary towards OWL and to be more and more expressive. And that's where the fun began. So, you know, I started working on it just as a way to get some consistent metadata to mobilize genomic records for analysis. And then I started to see, oh, this is quite interesting, actually, semantic representation. And then that became an obsession, a very unhealthy sort of thing. But it's a lot of fun. So in the it, it was part of this mixed specification that works with the INSDC, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. And um, it's a mandatory field there. And the idea there was to try to improve how the whole genome collection, metagenomes, et cetera, were mobilized. But then of course, interest started to grow. Other stakeholders um, were interested in using something that is web compliant, owl compliant, and has is inside the OBO stack for environmental description. And then um, it went from there. So we have a little website here, environmentontology.org, where you can read more about it. You can see the publications associated with it. This is the one back in the day. 
Um, and then this is the one later when we went, we jumped to OWL and we started doing some stuff, text mining and uh, annotating um, descriptions of habitats of organisms and order generating content. And uh, since then, it's just been growing. Different people use it to annotate different kinds of records in different ways. Again, we like to give generic advice of how to use it for annotation. Um, and then we do generate community specific guidelines if those are necessary. So for example, for Mix, we have our documentation page to, oops, there we go, to explain how to use it inside the fields, um, what a good annotation looks like, guidance on how to use things like our biome classifications, then local scale things like um, actual geological features, and then medium or materials, which then go into things like water or rock, etc. So it's been growing like that. And it's really been a community, community ontology in the sense that some parts of it are very terse. And some parts of it are very well axiomatized and well defined because we've had experts engage with us and review those parts. And even through ESIP with the semantic harmonization cluster, our cryosphere um, section got a big upgrade because of that. Some of our atmosphere stuff, winds, et cetera, got an upgrade because of a request at an ESIP meeting. Um, and then we get in different requests. So as I said before, it's part of the OBO, OBO Foundry, so the, or the OBO Foundry and Library, which has a whole collection of ontologies built on similar principles and aligned to the basic formal ontology, as we saw before. So Envo is down there. You can then access all of the stuff in the standard OBO format. And we've now just loosened the license to CC0. Um, that's Envo's entry. You can see some of the usage, some of the products that are out there. Um, there are many more users, of course, but that's just our entry page. And nicely, because the overall principles, for example, the openness, the format, having functional dereferenceable URIs, versioning of the, the scope is defined, definitions are written, etc. So it's part of the OBO. Now OBO has a dashboard that automatically checks that all of these principles are met or satisfied. And uh, we have a couple of bugs, but in general, Envo is looking pretty good. This will, this will be fixed pretty soon. So we like that sort of automated checking of the content of the ontology, because that makes it much more um, tractable to import and export our content into all of the other ontologies that can read it. And then it becomes reasoned, et cetera. So that's our GitHub page. That's where all the magic happens. Um, it's, again, a sort of standard OBO technology stack where we have our released products out here in JSON, OBO, and AL formats. Um, subsets for people who don't want to deal with the whole ontology. There are a collection of subsets for different things, astronomical body parts, biomes, um, hazards, etc. Again, these are generated based on community interest and whoever wants something like that can request a subset or create it themselves. We're trying to document our workflows much more um, in a much more detailed way on our wiki so that if anyone wants to understand how Envo is working or how to add classes to Envo, Stephen Chong, so one of Mark Schildhauer's uh, postdocs, I trained him up a little bit and he took notes as he did it and that turned into our documentation, which has been worked on by Kai Blumberg and others. Um, so we hope then people can create pull requests as are needed, which can then be reviewed and merged in there. So we're trying to document much more to make it uh, more workable. Try to organize our workflow into projects uh, based on what the community would like us to work on. Um, one recent one, which we actually completed very quickly, is one PhD students and two uh, one PhD student and two master's students working with me and UN Environment, um, an ontology for plastics because things that are out there in the um, plastosphere, and this will be into the STG reporting frameworks um, that are coming up in the UN data system. So that's quite fun. It's a good way to get it organized, and that also includes things like our cryosphere work, which is in our semantic harmonization group. A bunch of stuff is still open. But uh, this is where we merged a lot of that content and mapped it to suite. So that's the important part for interoperability. We try to cross map wherever possible, working with other developers to make sure that what's expressed in one is expressed in another, maybe slightly differently. Some will be more formal, others will be more relaxed. We try to meet in the middle. Um, and that's how it that's how it flows, really. So yeah, that's the code. Um, pull requests are coming in. And the development happens in our source folder where we work on our release. These are pre-release versions that where our, ed our editors work. Uh, there are 22 con contributors right now. We hope that number increases. Some, of course, much more active than others. 
We then mirror other ontologies, which we import, um, and we create our imports here, other OBO ontologies, which we pull in so that we don't duplicate the terms that would say chemical entities or um, uh, things inside the food on. Again, food on came out of Envo. We like to give away branches of Envo to other domain experts that know more about the subject matter. So we had a whole food hierarchy for in food environments of microbes that are now run by um, Damien Dooley and others, the gene ontology, IAO, other ontologies that we import to make sure that we're interoperable. Um, and then we have a series, we have our release history, so our, our tags. Where are they now? Of course, you can't find them when you're looking for them. They get to go up here. Exactly. So the 23 tags are the releases that we made. There was a bit of a hiatus, but we try to do that in a standard way where we describe what has changed. We list all the new terms that have been added since the last release. And we also then add um, a list of the new terms we've imported from other ontologies to allow us to cross axiomatize and um, do that in, again, in a way that um, other ontologies would understand. Um, I think we had, yeah, previous, previous exports you'll see inside some of the notes, uh, previous releases, sorry, you'll see in the notes that we work with a number of other organizations where we ask, hey, would you like us to express something in Envo? And they say, sure, you know, we get some, we get some expert input and then we try to add those, that content. So again, it grows where the interest is. Um, every time we make a release, Envo then is um, released through things like Ontobi or the EBI's ontology lookup service. So it's automatically harvested and then put out there. So it's easy to browse. Um, and then we've integrated it into other systems like the UN Ocean Best Practices System. It's part of the terminology stack that's used to tag the corpus of documents to allow enhanced semantic search. So for example, if you search for sea ice, it will go through that corpus. Um, this gets refreshed with Envo and then you can get a little semantic neighborhood of a term and then add it to increase your flow. So there are different applications, of course, also tagging environments in the encyclopedia of life of different organisms to create a habitat branch in order to generate content. Um, yeah, we're trying to increasingly map that to other ontologies like Sweet. And right now it's inside the ontology itself, but we'd like to move towards things like Triple SOM, which is like a simple standard for sharing ontology mappings, which could be a potential for this working group too, as we work on our different um, representations of geo the geoscience entities to use sort of SCOS predicates and some notes to be able to describe how they map, what the differences are, when to use which one, but also making sure that they can talk to each other. Um, that's the ontology, you can play with it. It's online, of course, a uh, bunch of classes, bunch of axioms. Many of them are imported. They're not all from Envo itself. Again, they come in from our imports, um, but we have some of the usual suspects. Some things like um, here we see a term for Graupel from our cryosemantics work, and you see then it's mapped to the suite thing through Ruth Adur, Gary Bergcross's uh, semantic harmonization cluster. And then we do some cross axiomatization to map it to other things that are in there and allow the machine to understand things from Pato, for example, things that are opaque and granular, allowing inference. And of course, uh, Envo is reasoned. So we always run a reasoner, Elk in this case, to check that everything is consistent and that there are no logical errors in anything that we've claimed. And so far that looks good. And this is every time it's continuous integration. So when we push changes, GitHub checks that we haven't broken anything because that's remarkably easy as your ontology gets more, um, more uh, involved, larger, et cetera. And then you can see where the reasoner then will auto-classify things into different um, hierarchies so that we don't have to do that manually. And um, yeah, that's a quick tour. There's much more to say, of course, but I think this gives you a feel of Envo, its nature. Some parts are really well-developed and well-axiomatized when we have expert input. Others are just sort of placeholders or, or stubs. And I think in this session, it's really exciting to see the work that's been going on to actually think very formally about geological entities. And indeed, if there's a way that we can cross map and put it into our user space or express it in the semantics that we have going on with the Oval Foundry and cross map back as we're doing with Suite, I think within the spirit of Serene, the cement, this Federation of Semantic Resources, we're getting closer to this like multi-perspective, multi-user um, environment. It kind of connects to what's on the jam boards. I don't think you can necessarily have too many geoscience ontologies if they're doing different things, but the important thing is that they're all 
talking to each other, interoperating, and are being co-developed. So I'll stop there, I think. Thanks, Pierre. You're welcome. So, so uh, you know, people have probably noticed in the, as you've been scanning through Envo there, that there are various geologic kinds of things in there, like gravel and mud and, and uh, extrusions and things like that. So, and Sweet also has, you know, various geologic things in it as well. And so one of the, you know, I guess to me, one of the questions is, is uh, looking at the ontologies that we heard about in detail during the session, um, which at least in large part seem to be conceptually not dramatically different. Um, and I think the mappings between them would probably be relatively straightforward. The question is, is, you know, what are the scenarios where it'd be useful to think about integrating those or map doing mappings into Envo or Suite? Are there, are there use cases for that? And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to anybody else who has any comments. And I'm going to bring up the Jamboard here as well to have a look at. Does anybody else have any comments? So it would be helpful. So I think the, the um, idea of suite is kind of a crossroads, a cross reference between these various resources seems like a, it might be a useful, um, a useful approach. Um, I guess another another question that strikes me that's probably more a conversation um, with uh, between the geoscience ontology and geocore and geontogenous is is does you know is there really a use use um, useful to think about trying to harmonize those um, so this so is Ruth and and I do have a comment on that I have totally seen where using semantics, even on, on, on data that is different, and, and I'm the one who put the sea ice chart stuff down in the lower right-hand corner, um, is where you can, it really does help the eye and fair, right? Because if somebody's using ontology A and doing using that to you know do their data metadata and stuff like that, and then somebody else is using ontology B to do a different data set, unless there's some way of linking those terms together, um, it, it'll be difficult to actually integrate those across those two different data sets. And, the, and this happened like 10 years ago where it was simple to take, you know, the CA charting community has an international standard, but then each country did it slightly differently. But because you could use, an, you know, basically mappings in an ontology to understand what those differences really meant, you could turn a Canadian map into a, into a Norwegian map pretty damn simply. And yes, in some cases, you might lose some information if the Canadians had more information in their maps than the Norwegians did, or et cetera. But if you don't have that, you can't do it. You have to do it yourself individually, one by one, instead of just making it a trivial Python script. Right. So I vote for harmonizing them all. And so this might take the form of the kind of mappings that um, Pierre mentioned, the SSOM, which is an interesting emerging technology for you know, a standard way of, of, of uh, documenting and representing mappings between ontologies. Um, as Pierre points out, the, the auto map or mapping between, between ontologies is, is uh, a non-trivial operation in a lot of cases, it takes a fair amount of effort. Just looking at the work that's been going on with the, cryos the cryosphere work between Envo and Sweet, thinking about what would be involved in correlating um, various lithology vocabularies. But if there was some way to actually capture those mappings when people do make the effort to do them, and record them so that they could be reused or as a starting point for other mappings seems like might be the most cost effective and reasonable approach to thinking about this larger integration problem rather than trying to 
create one ontology to rule them all, which probably isn't going to work. Yeah, and I think that that'll support a lot more um, innovation too. You know, you, because these things are not funded to the degree that they're going to be rapidly responding to requests. You know, they'd have to be a company in a sense if that's going to happen. Um, and even then you get into trouble. So we need to support innovation, but like from the onset, it's not, mapping is not something you do later, but what we've discovered in the semantic harmonization cluster is that if you get the domain experts in the room, when you're doing some of the mapping and you, you've articulated the actual knowledge well, um, it, it anchors all of the other, or all of the ontologies that are being mapped because, okay, they may have their own formalisms, their own approaches, but at least they're talking about more or less the same knowledge. That helps a great deal. I think we saw that with Ruth's um, cryosphere glossary harmonization and the, what we are moving on to next, disasters, hazards, et cetera. Some of the sessions we had in this meeting with the wildfire crowd seem to be going that direction too. You know, that expert knowledge stabilizes the knowledge representation activities. Yeah, right. I, I kind of agree with brother and the, 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 I see the another benefit is that uh, depending on how explicit is the ontology, if, even if the, the expert doesn't really agree, at least we have that uh, explicitly implemented. So we can we can verify where they disagree and, and see what we can, uh, can make to, to, to turn it around, which is, uh, I don't know if you have the same saying, but here in Brazil, we have a saying that three ontologists, three geologists in a room you have three different uh, interpretations. And uh, we, this is kind of the same with the ontologists, to, to be honest. Well, and we had that uh, that issue in the cryospheric terms as well. Depending on what sub-community you belong to, words like um, a thermokarst might be a process or it might be a landform. But with, with the harmonization, process, one could say that there is a thermokarst process and there is a thermokarst landform. Which one do you want? <laughs> but until you have that explicitly put somewhere, you know, you can have people talking across each other all over the place. Exactly. So if, if we started generating these mappings. Is there is there a way to persist them? Let's say with a community ontology repository, can that handle things like mappings? I'm not familiar enough with uh, what the op, what the possibilities are there. Well, I, I can't answer about the possibility, Steve. It's why I'm speaking, but I I do think that for some of the heavyweight ontologies where the differences are really uh, you know, in some fundamental aspects of, of how they're understood, uh, the mapping would have to, uh, would not be a simple one. It would be something like, well, these two things are, have different interpretations for the same thing in reality. And, and you know, those things exist, but they're a little more complex to put forward. Um, so, you know, anything that would involve mappings and harmonization would have to be able to essentially account for multiple interpretations. Uh, which uh, in my experience is uh, a good thing to do, but also difficult. Yeah, well, you are right that uh, there must might be different, uh, let's say philosophical views over, over the, the same entities. But uh, again, uh, the, the benefit is that uh, at least you know that you have this difference. The, the worst thing, the worst case scenario is that you don't know, but you just assume that you have the same understanding of reality and then you integrate the, the data and no, no. something not expected. Oh, I, I agree if those differences could be clarified it would be it would be very valuable. Uh, I'm just saying the degree to which they can be clarified right now um, I'm uncertain about but uh, you know that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and do it for example. Yeah no no uh, I know just, I know. It's a hard problem that's all. Uh, yes. I, I think we're at the stage where, you know, there's been some candidates that have been um, developing and it will take a little bit of time to understand their differences and, you know, what the best use cases are, uh, uh, which will lead to better harmonization and mapping. So it's probably still a bit early days, but uh, definitely the direction that uh, 
it should go. Well, good. Um, we're about out of time. And uh, the, uh, uh, anybody has any thoughts about takeaways, I'd suggest putting them in the chat. But what, what, I, what I am observing is that we have, you know, we heard about the three geoscience sort of domain specific ontologies, which have a lot of conceptual overlap between them. And we're looking at, you know, Envo and Suite that have some geoscience in them. And probably the way forward in thinking about using these things together and trying to improve interoperability is, is in working on the mappings between them rather than trying to develop a single integrated ontology. I would um, agree with that conclusion. And, but I also want to say that I also agree with um, Oyar that where you get into real, real conceptual issues is where the real is where worldviews vary uh, a lot. For example, I worked with the Exchange for Local Observations and Knowledge of the Arctic. And you can even add, you know, the way that, for example, an Inuit person thinks about sea ice and the way, you know, uh, no operator thinks about sea ice, unless those were the same people, of course, um, is very different because, you know, sea ice is basically means a livelihood for one group and the in the other case maybe it's you know something interesting about weather and shipping but you know the the world views uh differ but on the other hand you can at least document those differences and and that in itself is a useful thing to do because you can discover very interesting and useful things and and in the project i'm thinking about that really happened um, where the communities were not understanding each other so much. And that because we could document those differences, we actually could make a difference in real people's lives. Best. Yeah. Best and I think, uh, if like, if the ontologies are expressive enough or flexible enough, you could probably, you know, they're probably talking about slightly different things anyway, what they include in that linguistic pointer, right? So it's possible to then sort of associate, it, associate that label with the actual phenomena while still using the same um, semantic foundation. Uh, I think it, it is a thing. And, and then Steve, to your point, you know, I think a lot of these won't be integratable in that sense because they're doing different things. And I think that's where the sort of harmonization and mapping across them is so important because we don't wanna lose the stuff, the stuff that they're doing differently or the models that they're running differently because um, they're all bringing value into our collective ontological space here, semantic stack, if you will. But the question, the question is more one of coordination. You know, can we make sure that it's clear how they differ, when to use which one, um, where the strengths are, how they can complement each other? If we get that coordination down, I think then we are, we're developing something very powerful. Yes, thank you. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. And so thanks everyone for joining and especially thanks to Alizia for staying up late and, and uh, Brandon for getting up early to join us. Really appreciate it. I guess, Pierre, it's pretty late for you too. So thanks everyone. And uh, with that, we'll sign off and uh, hope to talk to you all again soon. Thanks, Steve. All right.